Uh, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, Max Ritchie. I'm the Executive Director of the Neurological Foundation, and a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, this will be a very special event, but first some housekeeping. Uh, should we need to vacate the building, please follow one of the Bruce Mason Centre ushers uh, through your nearest exit. And if you need any assistance, uh, please raise your hand. The 17th century French writer Francois de la Rochefoucauld asked, why is it that our memory is good enough to retain the least triviality that happens to us, yet not good enough to recollect how often we've told it to the same person? <laughs> it is possible that at least some of us are here today to hear Dr. Small because our children uh, or spouse have politely, sometimes not so politely, reminded us, yes, Dad, dear, you've told me that already, twice. Memory allows us to keep an account of our personal self. Without it, we would be lonely passengers, always traveling down an unknown road, with no idea how we got there, where we were going, or who our traveling companions were. It's no wonder then that memory loss or a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or some other type of dementia is such a frightening prospect for many people, probably for all of us. In recent years, modern sci uh, social science methods have been developed to measure the concept of disease burden. The burden of disease to society is measured by premature mortality or the number of years of healthy life lost to disability. The brain disease burden to individuals, families, to society, dwarfs everything else. While many brain disorders are causes of death, they have their biggest impact on society by causing devastating and persistent disability. Neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's, cause greater measured uh, burden than heart disease and cancer combined. Yet brain disease research, providing hope for medical progress and the only way to stop the impending epidemic of patient diagnoses, receives but a morsel of government research funding comparatively. If we don't do something about dementia, Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases, as the world's population ages, our health system, system will be crushed and the legacy for our children will be a burden that we could have lessened or prevented. The Neurological Foundation funds the best New Zealand researchers, and we have some of them here this morning, carrying out the best brain research with the greatest opportunity for impact. We make every research project uh, count, and we have facilitated many of New Zealanders' top brain researchers pioneering breakthrough, break breakthroughs as they work towards developing prevention strategies, treatment, and one day cures. And we are the only non government neurological research funding body in New Zealand. Incidentally, we don't receive any of that government uh, funding. Our members and supporters, and there are many here today, help us to sustain that high level of research we fund each year. And for that, I, I thank you. You can all support brain research in this country by joining the Foundation as we continue to set higher funding goals and nurture the brilliant research talent this country generates. Many of you, uh, of you have done that already, and again, I thank you for that. And each of us can help to lessen the projected brain disease burden by taking on some of the challenges that our special guest, Dr. Gary Small, will present today. While Dr. Small is optimistic that we will discover a definitive cure for Alzheimer's disease, for now, the most promising path is through prevention. 
that is, protecting a healthy brain rather than trying to reverse damage that has already occurred. De La Rochefoucauld also said, to achieve greatness, we should live as if we shall never die. It's my very great pleasure to welcome Gary Small to New Zealand. He has already appeared on Radio New Zealand's The Panel uh, yesterday afternoon and has a very busy week sharing his research with neurologists, researchers and the community. This is his first uh, public presentation. Please welcome Gary Small. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your warm welcome. Thank you, Max, for that lovely introduction and those important comments. I am so thrilled to be here in New Zealand. This is my first visit. I, uh, I've been to Australia a few times, and they didn't let me talk about New Zealand when I was there. I don't, I don't know why. But it's, it's such a lovely country. Everyone is so warm, and, and uh, the, the hospitality here has just been very compelling and remarkable. So I have a little bit of time today to talk to you about Alzheimer's disease and, and about prevention and share some of my ideas with you. And also I'll have some time toward the end where we can entertain some questions and hopefully I can address them for you. But before I begin with the content of my talk, I just wanted to get a show of hands. Uh, those of us here in the audience, how many of us have had a forgetful moment, maybe misplacing our keys or something like that? <laughs> You're such an honest group. I love that. Now, how many of us can't remember if we've had one? Anybody? Okay. So we're all in the right place. And in fact, I'm going to be talking about some of the methods you can use to compensate for those age-related moments of forgetfulness. But to begin, I, I just want to acknowledge some of my many collaborators, uh, the funding agencies, the potential conflicts of interest in this slide. And then seek to answer two questions. So the first question is, do we have any control over our brain health as we age? And the second question is, if we do, what can we do to forestall symptoms of Alzheimer's disease? And that's really going to be the focus of my discussion. Now, to get to the answer, let's begin with a moment of reflection on some of the people around the world who live to extraordinary uh, numbers of years. They have extreme longevity, live to 100 or more. And we find pockets of the world. These are called blue zones, places like Sardinia, Italy, Loma Linda, California, Okinawa, Japan. And if you study these groups, you find there's some quite interesting shared lifestyle approaches. These people are all physically active. They have strong social networks. If you've ever been to Sardinia, you can see the older folks sitting around and chatting, sipping their cappuccinos and so forth. And they have a diet that's rich in antioxidant fruits and vegetables healthy proteins, healthy grains. Now, this group of observations doesn't prove a cause and effect relationship between these lifestyle strategies and living to 100 or more. And in fact, if you decided to pick up and move to Okinawa, I can't guarantee that you're going to live that old. But it is a clue to maybe there's, there's some kind of link between how we live our lives every day and how well we live and how long we live. And this kind of observation has been backed up by many other large-scale epidemiological studies throughout the world. And there are individual examples of extreme healthy brain aging. And, and this is a woman many of you may have heard of, Madame Jean Calment, who, if you can do the math, you can see lived to 122 years of age. And this was well documented in the scientific literature. She did not have dementia or Alzheimer's disease when she died. And she too 
had an active, healthy lifestyle. She lived in the south of France. How many of us here have visited the south of France? So, wow, a lot of you. So, uh, you know about the Mediterranean diet. It's good for your heart. It's also good for your brain. She also was physically active, rode her bicycle around town. She was mentally active. And we think that there, again, is a link between that kind of behavior and her extraordinary healthy longevity. She was also an astute businesswoman. Somebody sent me an email and told me that when she was 94, she sold her apartment to a French businessman who agreed to pay her rent for the rest of her life. <laughs> This is when she was 94. And sadly, the businessman died 10 years later. <laughs> so this is the Calmont scheme of healthy aging. Now, when we think about quality longevity, because most of us want to live a long time, but we want to have quality of life throughout those years. Many people think that it's all about memory. And Memory is very important. Memory defines who we are. Without our memories, we have no past, we can't plan for the future, and we can't enjoy the present. But healthy brain longevity is more than just a strong memory. We need to have a good mood. If we're anxious or depressed, that's going to distract us. We're not going to have a good memory. We need to be able to pay attention and focus, we need to be able to relax, we need to be able to reason, and we need our memory and our mood and all these features to help us with those tasks. So really, it's all these aspects of our mental health that is so critically important, and if we can preserve those abilities, then we can make the right decisions about staying healthy and living a healthy lifestyle. Now, one of the things that our group and many other scientific groups have noticed that there, there are some challenges in healthy aging and keeping our brains in top form. And one has to do with inflammation. Now, you've probably heard the term inflammation, and it refers to a whole system in our body that helps protect us from injury or infection. So if you sprain an ankle, you notice it gets warm, it, it swells, it gets red, and, and that's uncomfortable, but it's a good thing because it tells us that your inflammatory cells are repairing the damage. Now, a problem as we age is that that inflammatory system gets overactive. It ratchets up into high gear, and we have too much inflammation, and that's bad for our heart, it's bad for other organs, and it's especially bad for our brain. If you look very closely at a, an autopsy tissue of an individual who suffered from Alzheimer's disease, you can see evidence of inflammation. Little cells called activated microglia, other chemicals complement. And so what we think may be happening is that we have this heightened inflammation and it's causing, rather than repairing damage, it's causing more damage. And many of the lifestyle strategies I'll be talking about are actually anti-inflammatory. Physical exercise, consuming or consuming omega-3 fats from fish, or getting a good night's sleep. I flew in from Los Angeles, I think it was a day or two ago, <laughs> and uh, I slept a bit on the plane, but I was a bit dazed. And, and last night I finally caught up on my sleep, and I know I have much greater mental clarity, much greater energy, and so get, just getting a good night's sleep is, is critically important for our brain health. Now, we hear so much about Alzheimer's disease. It's in the news, it's on our minds. Uh, every other day there's another article, uh, something on the, the internet, and it frankly is a bit confusing. Uh, one day we're telling you take vitamin E, the next day we're telling you don't take vitamin E. And so what I'm gonna to try to do today is help sort that out. I, I show some images of individuals, uh, entertainers, other famous people who have talked about their diagnosis, and, and even one of our former presidents in the United States. And one reason we're seeing so much more of that is that we are 
diagnosing the problem early. We're get, getting better at that. And also, we're living longer. Now, that's great. Medical technology has taken us to a stage where average life expectancy has increased remarkably. In the United States, for example, if you were born in 1900, you would be lucky if you saw your 50th birthday. Today, on average, in, in developed countries, people live to their late 70s. Uh, women tend to live longer in their early 80s. So we've made extraordinary gains. The problem is age is the single greatest risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's dementia. By age 65 or older, the risk for the average person is about 10%. And if you make it to age 85, it's almost 50%, according to some studies. So every other person will have dementia. Now, in New Zealand, you've got your own challenges here. There's over 40,000 people already suffering, and the costs are quite high, over 700 million each year. And these trends are only going to continue by 2050 we expect the numbers to triple. And in fact, every, uh, every third person in New Zealand will be 65 or older, the age when that risk begins to increase. So what is Alzheimer's disease? Now, I know the term often frightens people, but let's just go back for a moment and define what we know about it. And it actually began in 1906 when Aloise Alzheimer described the first case of Alzheimer's disease to the medical community. A woman who was 51 developed confusion that rapidly progressed. She became psychotic, so she was out of touch with reality. And after four years, she passed away. And what Professor Alzheimer did was to apply special stains to her brain tissue after autopsy. And what he saw under the microscope from those stains, you see here, these little tiny dots we call amyloid plaques and tau tangles. These are little waxy, abnormal, proteinaceous or protein deposits that collect in the brain in all those areas that control brain health, thinking, memory, all those aspects. Now, the medical community didn't think much of it because they thought, well, that's interesting, but rarely do people develop this level of confusion early in life. So they called it a pre-senile dementia. Years later, in the late 1960s, uh, several pathologists studied a group of people who had what we used to call senility. We used to think as you got older, you just got confused. That's a normal part of aging. Well, it turned out when they looked into their brains, they saw those same amyloid plaques and tau tangles. So now we realized that senility is really a form of late onset Alzheimer's disease. Now, that had a mixed uh, reception. On the one hand, people were frightened. Now we have an epidemic of Alzheimer's disease because of the grain of our population. On the other hand, recognizing this forced doctors and scientists to start doing something about it, to start looking for better ways to diagnose it and better treatments. So here you see a couple of brains that one of my uh, uh, colleagues, Harry Vinters, who's a pathologist at UCLA, uh, provided these images for me. And one brain is typical of Alzheimer's disease. You see it's what we call atrophied or shrunken. And the other one is nice and plump, and that's a normal brain. And those insets show you some of the areas where there's a density of these plaques and tangles in the front part of the brain, the frontal lobe underneath the temples, the temporal lobe, an important memory center. But you can notice in that normal brain, you see there's a couple of tangles and there's a, an isolated plaque. And it turns out when pathologists started studying people who died from car accidents or cancer, other causes from young ages, from 20s, 30s, 40s, and so forth, that these plaques and tangles actually build up in normal aging. All of us have them. The question is how rapidly will they build up and at what point will we reach that threshold where it's associated with a more profound mental impairment. So to try to understand that better, our group at UCLA has done a lot of work in brain scanning or brain imaging. 
particularly with a technique called positron emission tomography, or PET scanning. So the way this technology works is pretty much like a Geiger counter. It measures radioactivity. And to do the experiments, we inject a radioactive dye into the vein of the patient or the research volunteer. And it's taken up by the brain. And then we put them in the scanner. And the scanner measures where the radioactivity is, where it's heightened, and where it is not present. And so what our group did, with the help of a, a brilliant chemist, George Barrio, was to develop a small molecule, a little dye that we could inject, that actually attached itself for the first time to these little plaques and tangles. So we could see Alzheimer's in the brain of living people for the first time. Until we developed this, you couldn't really do that until somebody went to autopsy. So this was an important development. And here you see an, an animation that has put together surface projections on the brain of a group of 20 of these PET scans. They're called FDDMP PET scans. And the colors, as they get warmer, that tells us that there are more plaques and tangles in the brain. Now here we're starting, this, these are people with normal aging, where there's very little yellow, but th that yellow indicates there's already some of the disease in their brain. These people may not get dementia or symptoms for another 10, 15 years. So we're, we're at the point now where we can see these problems early on. And that's very helpful with our research. Now, another helpful discovery is in genetics. And, and when I started out in this field, we, we had no genes for Alzheimer's disease. We had no treatments. Uh, there wasn't all that much we can do. But now we have identified genetic causes and genetic risks. Now, a genetic cause is what a, what would, what a specialist would call a mutation. So there's an error in the DNA, the heritable material we all carry in all of our cells. And that error, if a person has it, will cause the disease. And it means that in families that have this genetic mutation, 50% of relatives will get the disease. And it's usually at a young age. Now, fortunately, that kind of genetic Alzheimer's disease is very rare less than 1% of cases. But you might have read about some of this in the news where they're doing studies on families in, in Colombia uh, who have this gene and they're trying to test them. And, and people will have the gene and not have symptoms so they can find out if new drugs or injections or vaccines can prevent the disease from occurring in these people who we know definitely will get it. And if there is a family where half of people are affected, around the same age. Often it starts in the 50s. We, we saw one family, I remember from Hawaii years ago, where the average age at onset in that family was 32 years. It was really quite tragic. Uh, and it was a difficult family to deal with. Now, for most of us, that's not an issue. Uh, we have what are called genetic risks. So that means that you carry in your genetic material, this risk that increases the probability you're going to get Alzheimer's disease at a slightly younger age, but it's neither necessary nor sufficient to develop the disease. So the most common one, and, and the one we were involved in detecting with Alan Roses and Margaret Perry Check Vance at, at Duke University, is called ApoE4, apolipoprotein E4. So this is a gene that has three different forms and 20% of the population carries ApoE4. And in this room, you know, one out of every five of us has that genetic risk. And it could be even higher, because I imagine a lot of us here have a family history of Alzheimer's. And so uh, we find that that increases the prevalence of that gene. But even if you carry that gene, and by the way, we don't recommend people get the genetic testing for ApoE because it doesn't give us enough information to predict what's going on. But even if you have that genetic risk, it's not a reason to give up hope. Uh, we and others have done studies that have found that people with the genetic risk, if they live a healthier lifestyle, they have less Alzheimer's in their brain. So genetics is, is certainly not the whole story, although it's an important part of the story, and we're studying it 
all the time. Now let me just pause for a moment to clarify a few terms that I'm using and I will continue to use. First, I've used the term memory. And a simple way to define memory is having two components, learning and recall. So we need to get that information into our heads and we need to be able to retrieve it when we want it later. But I also use the term cognition or cognitive functioning. And that encompasses other mental skills like attention, language, uh, visual spatial skills, the ability to read a map, to reason, and to think. Someone with dementia, that term refers really not just to memory loss, but any kind of cognitive loss that interferes with everyday life. So, you know, as my opening joke alluded to, we all have memory challenges, but likely for most people in this room, it's not interfering with everyday life, so we don't have dementia. Now, Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, and it a, has a gradual onset, a gradual progression, and in the brain, we see those tiny amyloid plaques and tau tangles. But there are many other causes of dementia. You, you can have a, a drug side effect that can cause dementia. One of the first cases of so-called Alzheimer's disease I saw when I was in my training was someone who was taking a, an anxiety drug, uh, Valium. It was a number of years ago. People don't usually take that now. He was taking 10 milligrams of Valium each day. I just weaned him from his Valium, and I cured his Alzheimer's disease. So clearly it wasn't Alzheimer's disease, but it could be medical problems. And so the doctor routinely will do a series of laboratory tests to make sure there isn't a problem like that. And sometimes even someone with Alzheimer's disease has a concurrent medical condition, and when that's treated, that helps their cognitive functioning. But there's a lot of confusion about these terms. I, I remember several families coming in and telling me, well, they had a diagnosis for their mother, and thank God it's not Alzheimer's, it's only dementia. <laughs> now, clearly they didn't understand that sometimes dementia can be a bad thing. I mean, you can have even if it's not Alzheimer's, you can have small strokes in the brain, which can't be cured, but it can be managed. You can have Lewy body dementia, uh, frontal temporal dementia, and so forth. But it's confusing. So sometimes I like this way of breaking it down. Uh, my life broken down into segments, about a third sleeping, a third working, and a third looking for things I had just a minute ago. <laughs> so the most common memory complaints uh, anybody want to guess what the most common is? Names, yes. Actually, when you do surveys and people are complaining about memory, 85% of the time it's names and faces. So you see the face, you recognize that, but you can't remember the name. Where you put things. Forgetting an appointment or plan, what we call prospective memory. Uh, I remember somebody, now we're also attached to our cell phones, and uh, uh, somebody, a friend, I'm not going to mention who it was, you know, usually kept her cell phone in her purse when she drove. And she was driving, talking on the phone, and she reached over and she didn't find the phone in her purse, and she panicked. And she said to the person, I can't find my cell phone. Please, let me hang up and call me back. <laughs> you know. So, and, and there's always, you know, the other, the classic one is you can't find your glasses and you walk by the mirror and you see you're wearing them on top of your head. So we can joke about this and under, uh, of course underneath the humor is a little bit of anxiety that, oh my God, what does this mean? And then there's the tip of the tongue phenomenon where you, you, know, you know that word, but it just doesn't roll off the tip of your tongue. So now fortunately, we now have methods, and I'm going to share some of them with you, to help us overcome and compensate for those normal uh, age-related forms of forgetfulness. So when I see people in my clinic, often I draw a figure that looks something like this to try to explain to them how I understand the problem. So you have a vertical axis that, rec that represents how well your brain is working, and then the horizontal axis is age or time, and you can see there's this downward slope. So all of us are going on this downward slope at a certain rate, depending on genetics, depending on 
lifestyle, and depending on things we don't even understand. And there's three major stages. One is normal aging, where the, the forgetfulness doesn't really interfere with life and it's something we joke about. When that progresses more, then there's this, a condition that Ron Peterson at Mayo defined as mild cognitive impairment, or MCI. Now, in this stage, people are more forgetful and they're working much harder to compensate. Uh, one of the symptoms I've seen in some people who were uh, meticulously on time, they be, start being late. And what happens? You know, you're leaving the house and you think, did I check the doors? Where's my purse? Where did I put my keys? And so it takes time to compensate for that. Now, this condition does put somebody at risk for developing dementia. In fact, every year, people with MCI have about a 10% risk of developing dementia, so that after five years, 50% of them will have dementia. And again, dementia is when their compensation breaks down and they need help from others. Now, this is a photograph my wife took of me and her 104-year-old grandmother, Grandma Ollie. So in the interest of disclosure, let me just say that I was not injecting myself with anabolic steroids. <laughs> Grandma Ollie was a very short woman, and in fact, she got shorter as she aged. Uh, she developed osteoporosis, which is brittle bones, and it leads to compression fractures of the spine, which is why she tended to shrink. And one reason she developed that is that she did not take estrogen after menopause. And there's been a lot of research looking at the connection between estrogen and brain health in older women. And in fact, many years ago, a study found that women who took postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy had a lower risk for developing dementia. That led to clinical trials where doctors randomized older women to either estrogen or a placebo. And what they found when they did that, the estrogen didn't seem to help. In fact, the women over 65, it seemed to accelerate their cognitive decline. And estrogen, like other interventions, what we're finding is that there's, the timing is very important. Early on, around peri perimenopause, it may be helpful, but later on, it may actually not be good for an older brain. So now Grandma Ollie, without her estrogen, she did very well. I mean, she was, she was living in a, a three-flight walk-up apartment in the Upper West Side of New York City, so she was getting lots of exercise. She was mentally quite active. She was always on the phone, talking to people. If you forgot her birthday, you'd hear about it, trust me. <laughs> And so even though it could be, she could be a little annoying, she was very socially engaged, which is another pr predictor of brain health as we age. But even with all those great signs and her great mind, I would always worry about her when we go to visit because I knew she was at the age of risk. So I would try to sneak in a mental status exam because she would never, <laughs> she'd never let me do it, you know, on my own. And I remember this visit in particular I started out and I said, well, well, Grandma, how old are you right now? And she paused and said, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so she passed her mental status exam right, right out of the gate. Now, unfortunately, most of us don't do that well at 104. So here's this decline curve. What we're trying to do is intervene early so we can slow down that curve. We'd like to just stabilize it. Maybe that will happen. We don't know. But the idea is early detection and delaying the onset of symptoms. We think this will have a much greater impact than trying to repair damage in the brain once it becomes extensive. This is just a timeline of the development of medications for the disease. Uh, and I remember all these events. I mean, back in 1993, we had the first drug treatment for Alzheimer's. Very hard to work with. You had to give it to people for four times a day, it caused liver problems. Then there was another drug that came out a few years later that was much easier to use, and several others, and these were primarily symptomatic treatments. And there's been, in the meantime, a lot of work trying to develop other drugs that have a greater impact. And so, 
if you put somebody on placebo uh, who has Alzheimer's dementia, you're just going to see this steady decline indicated by the white line. If you treat them with one of these drugs that are now available, I, I know they, you, they're probably advertised on television here and certainly uh, in other countries around the world, drugs like Dinepazil or Aricept, Exelon or Rivastigmine, Nemenda or Memantine. You can see by that amber line that it, it helps to some degree, but it doesn't change the slope of decline. And when that line becomes dotted, that represents when the treatment is withdrawn too early. And you see, if you stop it too early, people go back to the placebo level of decline, they get worse. So these are called symptomatic medicines because they do help to some degree, not miraculously, but they help people stay at a higher level of functioning longer. What the research is now targeting are what we call disease-modifying treatments. So we can really get to the heart of the disease and do something about it. So, that if you, so you see there's a change in the slope of decline, and if you stop the medicine, there's a sustained benefit. So a way of thinking about this, if you had pneumonia and you took aspirin, you'd feel better. It would treat the symptoms. You'd have less fever. You'd have less discomfort. But you'd need an antibiotic, a disease-modifying treatment to really wipe out the disease. And there have been many different approaches. I've just listed some of them here. There's been a huge focus on trying to clear those little amyloid plaques out of the brain. And sadly, 99% of those drug trials have not been successful. They're still working on this approach in some of these uh, families that have the early onset genetic form of Alzheimer's, and we'll see if it works as a prevention treatment or not. There's some, been some work trying to attack those tau proteins. Uh, another area that I think is very promising, again, is anti-inflammatory treatments at the right point. They've used cholesterol-lowering drugs, even intranasal insulin spray because of the connection between diabetes and Alzheimer's. So these are all ongoing clinical trials. An example of one of these, a few years ago, we received money from the National Institutes of Health to study a common anti-inflammatory drug in people who just had normal aging, mild memory complaints, on average about 60 years of age. And after 18 months, we found that those who took the medicine had better memory and, as indicated by the yellow area on that brain, they had better brain function in the frontal lobe of the brain, an area that's involved in thinking and memory. But those people uh, took that medicine at a certain age when it was very mild. Other studies have found that anti-inflammatory drugs like estrogen can accelerate brain aging if there's already a lot of plaque in the brain. So there's a tipping point when these drugs will be helpful. And the problem with this kind of study is that it was relatively small, and uh, we're talking about using this in people with normal memory, anti-inflammatory drugs have a lot of side effects. And unless we're really convinced this is something that makes sense, we don't want to prescribe that to everybody. And we're looking for safer ways to go. Now, this is what I'd like to be doing when I'm 95. The chances are I won't be doing it because I've never pole vaulted in my life. I do not have the pole vaulting gene. But that's OK, because as I said, genetics is not the whole story. And the MacArthur Study of Successful Aging and other studies have shown that non-genetic factors are hugely important. They may be even more important than genetics for the average person. So I'm going to spend some time talking about these approaches, physical exercise, mental stimulation, stress management, and proper nutrition. Now, we did a study a few years ago with a group called Gallup Poll that calls people up across the United States. They get a very uh, representative sample of individuals. And we had data on nearly uh, 20,000 people, ages 18 to 99. And so we were able to stratify them according to young adult, middle age, or older adult. And we got Gallup Poll for the first time to ask people a very simple question. Do you have memory problems? And we found, as we expected, that memory problems became more frequent as people got older. Yet, there were still complaints in young adults. 14% of them complained about their memory. Another interesting finding in that study, we also looked at healthy behavior habits, whether you ate fruits and vegetables, whether you smoked or not, whether you exercised. And we found that older people lived healthier than younger people. 
And at first I thought, that, that doesn't sound right. I see all these young people jogging in the park and so forth. But if you think about it, young people also tend to drink a lot and smoke, and they do lots of things they probably shouldn't do, and it doesn't bother them. But as you get older, your doctor will tell you you've got to lose weight, you've got to stop smoking, and you tend to listen to that person. And also, if you live an unhealthy lifestyle, your life expectancy is shorter. So there's less likelihood you're going to live to 85 and somebody's going to call you on the phone for a poll. Now, the most important finding in this study was that the more healthy behaviors people reported, the fewer memory complaints. And it was almost an additive effect. So if you didn't smoke, your memory was better than if you did smoke. If you didn't smoke and you ate fruits and vegetables, your memory is even better, and so on. So what about some of these lifestyle habits? How do they work? And, and which ones should we be engaging in? How much? I, I start with physical exercise because we have the most data on physical exercise. And what happens when we get our hearts to pump oxygen and nutrients to our brains, our brains get bigger, we, our brains function better, uh, our body produces chemicals, one called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is, is like fertilizer for the brain. It gets your brain cells or neurons to sprout branches or dendrites so the brain cells communicate more effectively. Uh, we, anybody here who's exercised, uh, gotten cardiovascular exercise, you know about how it lifts your mood. We often call it runner's high, and that's endorphins circulating throughout your brain that lift your mood, help us with pain, and it's, it's very important. And the good news is we don't all have to become triathletes to gain the benefit of physical exercise. One study found that just walking briskly 20 minutes each day will lower one's risk for Alzheimer's disease. And if you can't walk, try to swim, do whatever you can to move around to get your heart to pump a little more to increase your circulation in the brain. You'll also sleep better at night, and we talked about how important sleep is to brain health. Now, Arthur Kramer at the University of Illinois has studied this extensively and actually randomized older adults to a physical exercise program or just stretching and toning. So one group will walk briskly and the other group will just do mild, very mild stretching. And these data show what happens to the size of an area of the brain called the hippocampus, deep under the temples. And this is a very important area of the brain that consolidates our memories so they can go into long-term storage. And look what he found. Uh, after six months, so the, the um, hatched line is the control group, and the solid line is the intervention group that walked. After six months and after a year, you can see that hippocampus growing in size. So the, the bottom line is a bigger brain is a better brain. So if somebody calls you a fathead, it's actually a compliment. <laughs> now, some of our junior scientists at UCLA at the Semmel Institute in our Division of Geriatric Psychiatry and Longevity Center have taken this a step further. They did this study where they're plotting on the vertical axis, it says MTL, that means medial temporal lobe, which is the area of the brain where the hippocampus resides. So up on the graph means a bigger brain, low means a smaller brain. And on the horizontal axis, they just asked a simple question, how much time do you spend sitting each day? And guess what? The more time sitting, the smaller that medial temporal lobe. So a lot of people are concerned about this, uh, and they have new workstations where they're standing and walking on treadmills and so forth, trying to not sit so much. Now, it may be that sitting is just a surrogate marker for how much you're actually exercising, but I often urge people to try to sprinkle physical activity throughout their day. And it's not just aerobic or cardiovascular conditioning. Studies have found that strength training with resistant bands or weights adds additional cognitive benefits. Now, what about mental exercise? That's kind of all in vogue. Brain fitness is a huge international market. Uh, mental stimulation can activate our neural circuits. Many studies have found it's associated with a lower risk for Alzheimer's disease, so people who will go to college or engage in lifelong learning have a lower risk. <clears throat> 
you know, so everybody's doing puzzles and, and games and trying to make their brains fitter through all this activity. Now, the connection between that mental stimulation and brain health is not quite as strong from the evidence as the physical exercise evidence. So I would tell people, if you, you have time either to take a brisk walk or do a crossword puzzle, take the walk. And if you have even more time, try to do both of them. We're actually doing a study right now where we're taking older adults, putting them on stationary bicycles, and once they get their heart going, then we give them the memory training to see if there's a synergistic effect if you do it at the same time. Now, in terms of memory training and techniques to compensate for memory loss, that there's very good evidence. We've done many studies. There have been uh, national and international studies showing that if you can learn certain techniques, it actually can improve your cognitive performance. And, and a lot of these uh, lessons and curricula are now delivered online, but there's a challenge with the whole digital media situation, particularly for the age group that's at risk for Alzheimer's, is that these people tend not to use their technology as much. And many of them come into the office and they complain about it. They say, Dr. Small, I can't remember phone numbers anymore. And they're worried about their memory. I tell them, first, don't worry about your memory because that's going to make your memory worse. And pick and choose what you commit to memory. So you can keep those phone numbers in your smartphone and try to work on other memory techniques like learning names and faces. So we call this generation the digital immigrants who have come to the technology later in life. Uh, they're slower to adopt it. Uh, they kind of like devices that look like this, <laughs> you know, kind of old school. It's still part of our language. We talk about dialing on the phone. So it's in the media. Is Google making us stupid? If there's any digital natives in the room, I want to point out that stupid is misspelled on this uh, <laughs> magazine. So we wanted to understand this better. We, we wondered, well, maybe Google is making us smart, and let's see what happens to the brain when we search online. And I was particularly interested in understanding what does the brain look like the first time we search online. And so to do that study, we had to recruit people who had never searched online. And I quickly learned I couldn't recruit them online. It just wasn't going to work. <laughs> so we had people like this. Congratulations, you're the last person on earth to get an email account. This is probably the hardest, hardest part of the study. <coughs> Not surprisingly, these were older adults. So the people in the study were in their mid-60s. And we matched these uh, digitally or uh, internet naive people to uh, a group that was of similar age and education who had searched online, had experience with them. And they put them in the MRI scanner and altered it in a way so that we could see brain blood flow from moment to moment. This is called functional MRI. And we had them wear these special goggles so we could show them images like a book page. We could see what their brain was doing when they read a conventional book. And then we had simulated internet search pages and they had a little mouse at their side so they could search online. We gave them tasks, age appropriate tasks like you know, find a good walking trail in Los Angeles. We didn't say, well, find a good skateboard park. I don't think many of them <laughs> would be doing that. And so they were motivated to do this study. So this is a summary of what we found. <coughs> <coughs> the colored areas represent a composite from the computer of where the brain was working during the mental task. So when the internet naive people read the book page, you can see there was a little bit of activity in their brain represented here. When they searched online for the first time, the red indicates what their brain looked like. And it was identical. There was no difference. So then when we looked at the internet savvy people, saw the same pattern when they read the book page. But here was a big difference. These people with prior internet experience, when they searched online, there was a huge level of activity. I mean, their brain was having a party. So here's your brain on a book, and here's your brain on Google. Now, we don't know if it actually made people smart, but it seemed that we could train our brains to, to activate more from doing this mental task. So we think what happens, if you look at brain activation on the vertical axis versus time, any new task, whether it's searching online, trying to figure out how to set the uh, alarm on your new phone or how to set the clock in your new car, 
When you start out, you don't understand how to do it. And so if we measure your brain activity, there's not much going on. At some point, you figure it out, and that's when you engage those neur neurons. That's when there's this burst of activity, as we saw in this experiment. But we found from other studies, as you get better at it, when it becomes routine, you see less activity. So we develop cognitive efficiency. And in many of these studies and in many of these curricula that we have, that's what we're, our aim is, to make people's brains more efficient at mental tasks that are important. Now, certainly one could argue that you want to be at that high point and exercise your brain cells, and that's what we do a lot with brain games. I always tell people, train but don't strain your brain. So find that puzzle or that activity that is fun. It's a little bit of a stretch, but it's not too difficult so that it becomes stressful or it's not too easy so it becomes boring. Now, there are game developers who have looked at the neuroscience and tried to develop new technologies to help people train specific mental skills. At UC San Francisco, there's a group that has been developing a game they call Neuro Racer, where the player tries to keep a race car on a windy road while informative and distracting road signs pop up. And so it trains multitasking skills. And what they find is that someone who's 80, who plays this game for a couple of weeks, actually performs better than, than a 20-year-old who's naive to the game. So at any age, we can develop these skills. Uh, so other studies have shown improved attention and reaction time from some of these games. Or there have been several studies at this point where they find that surgeons who play video games actually make fewer errors in the operating room. So the next time you have to have electric, elective surgery, forget about looking at those diplomas. Ask them, how many hours a week do you play World of Warcraft? <laughs> so there's this uh, whole area of brain fitness that people are studying. We have lots of programs at UCLA, a brain boot camp, a memory maintenance program. Uh, we have memory training curricula that we've licensed all over the US. Uh, we're in 12 states now. We just uh, secured a license in Canada, and they're coming down to visit us. And we teach these simple memory techniques and also lifestyle approaches so people can have a healthier brain. Uh, here's some of the studies we've done. We did a six-week program that showed significant improvement, a, a two-week program that not only improved memory, but you can see from that brain PET scan composite that it had an effect on cognitive efficiency in the frontal lobe. So we can rewire our brains in just two weeks to make them work better. And, and here's a, a functional MRI scan that shows you a little bit of what we see. The upper images are of a 46-year-old woman who was complaining about her memory. And while she was in the scan, we did kind of a, a brain stress test. We gave her uh, some memory uh, tasks and she tried to work at them. She didn't perform all that well. And you see her brain was really red, representing a lot of brain activity at baseline. She spent two weeks on one of our healthy brain programs. And later, after those two weeks, we repeated that experiment. And you can see there's very little activity, which represented much improved brain efficiency because her memory scores improved dramatically. And on verbal memory, she improved by 200%. So it is possible to get those brain wires to work better so you can lift more weight without straining yourself. And the techniques are very simple. So uh, one of them, one of the basic techniques we call look, snap, connect. Look is a reminder to focus your attention. If you're not paying attention, you can't get that information into your memory stores. Snap is a reminder to create a mental snapshot use images. Your, our brains are really hardwired. They've evolved so that we have extraordinary visual memory. And connect is a way of making those mental snapshots meaningful. If something is meaningful, it will be memorable. So we try to apply this to practical situations. So at UCLA, we used to have a lot 3B, very complicated medical center. And whenever I'd park in lot 3B, I'd see three large Bs over my car. Now that in a way, uses emotional memory because I can remember getting stung by a bee and how upsetting that was. And we always remember those emotional moments. If I parked in lot 2B, I would see William Shakespeare reciting to be or not to be on my car. 
Now, you may not want to share all your personal images with your friends, but trust me, you can be creative and it really does work. So who remembers her name? Holly. Very good. Now, you remembered it because I showed you her name and I probably repeated it. So rehearsal and repetition is very important for a strong memory. But if I went too quickly, you probably said, oh, well, that was grandma because grandma was part of the story. So you can meet Ollie and you can look at her and you might think, well, she has kind of an owl-shaped face or maybe she has olive-colored skin, so olive Ollie. You meet Paul Foreman and you notice, well, he's got a receding hairline. I see his forehead, forehead Foreman. <laughs> Harry, well, he's easy, he's got a lot of hair. <laughs> Lisa has a beautiful, subtle Mona Lisa smile. And then you meet Sue Bangle, she tells you she's an attorney. You notice her bangs for bangle, and then attorney, oh goodness, she could sue me. So again, emotional memory. Now, to prove to yourself how easy this is, you can use Look, Snap, Connect for the story method. So here you're just taking each word, creating a mental image, you're doing the snap, and you're linking them together by creating a story. So I'm gonna read these words to you. And uh, silently, I want you to think of a story and link up all the characters and objects in that story so you'll remember it. You ready? Beach, professor, horse, teddy bear, cigar, nun, palm tree, pasta. Maybe we'll get a volunteer in a moment to tell us their story. So now while you're stressing out about your story, let's talk about stress <laughs> and how it affects risk for Alzheimer's. It actually increases stress. Animal studies have found that chronic stress leads to smaller brains and worse memory. In human studies, chronic stress can cause depression where people get distracted, increase dementia risk. People prone to stress have a two-fold increased risk for Alzheimer's. If you take a human volunteer and inject that person with cortisol, a stress hormone, you find there's temporary memory impairment. Now the good news, it's temporary. When you take away the stress hormone, memory returns. And there's been a lot of studies showing that many different stress management techniques help memory, help mood, and uh, Helen Lavretsky in our institute has done studies looking at telomerase. This is part of the length of the DNA, an enzyme involved in that, and it, it predicts how long we're going to live. So lowering stress will improve your brain health and increase your life expectancy. And these studies just show some of the areas of the brain that are altered in functioning from simple stress management exercises, from just meditation 10 minutes a day. And you know, this is something actually I've been starting to do every morning and I use a little app, you can download these apps that give you a guided meditation experience. And I find that when I do it, I'm just much more relaxed. It, it lasts for quite a bit of time. And uh, it really enriches your life, helps your memory and helps your physical health. It can lower blood pressure and have a lot of other benefits for you. Now, nutrition is very important for brain health and I want to make a few points about that. Number one is weight management. We have a worldwide epidemic of obesity and overweight, and those increase our risk for Alzheimer's. So trying to eat smaller meals throughout the day and even in between snacks. I often recommend combining a healthy protein with a healthy carbohydrate because the protein will give you sustained satiety so you won't get hungry before the next meal. The kinds of fats we eat are very important. Omega-3 fats from fish, and nuts. If you don't like fish, you can sprinkle flaxseed onto your cereal. These are anti-inflammatory and protect brain health. Uh, and fish, you can grill it, that's important. If you eat fried fish, that doesn't count. Uh, antioxidant fruits and vegetables, it's recommended that at least five servings a day are served. And uh, that antioxidant effect of those fruit, colorful fruits and vegetables counteracts the wear and tear of oxidation on our cells. It destroys DNA and the cells themselves. And finally, we all love those chips and the donuts and the processed foods and refined sugars. I'm not saying you have to cut it out completely, but it's important to try to minimize that to protect our brain health, lower our risk for type 2 diabetes. It's a challenge helping people 
with their diet and their nutrition. We found in the programs we've done in the research, that's probably the hardest thing for people to change. You have to go and buy different foods and try different recipes and so forth. But when they do it, they thank us and it really has a big impact. But you know, there is this trend. If you look at evolution and body weight, <laughs> they were trying to figure it out. In New York, they outlawed big sugary drinks and people protested. Uh, but there is a reason to take this seriously. There have been studies of obese individuals who have been given geri a bariatric surgery, which helps them lose weight very quickly. And they find when they check their memory before and after the surgery, three months later, significant improvements. And now they follow these people for several years and they find there are sustained benefits in terms of memory. And I've had patients report this to me uh, spontaneously, who have gone on diets, lost weight, they find that their cognitive performance improves. It's easy for us to say, control your eating habits. And neuroscientists have tried to study this more. And this slide just summarizes some of what's been found. And there's different parts of the frontal lobe, the thinking brain, that helps us or hinder us, hinders us in this pursuit. So the blue area is the area that kind of tells us, it's right about here, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. It tells me after I've eaten dinner that I probably shouldn't have that second helping of that really attractive slice of chocolate cake. So it's saying, don't eat the cake. But then right here above my eyes, the orbital frontal brain is saying, eat the cake. It's going to taste good. So it's sort of a battle of the brain that goes on as we try to resist these foods. But what happens if we can resist it initially and change our habits? The brain wiring actually changes. So you change your behavior, it changes your brain, and that will eventually change your body and change your trajectory and risk for Alzheimer's. So while we're talking about uh, nutrition, let's talk about alcohol for a moment. So wine, spirits, in moderation, are associated with lower risk for Alzheimer's. So some people will say, well, how much is one glass of wine? Is it like this? <laughs> it's really, the, the studies show on average about one drink for a woman per day and two for a man. Probably has to do with size, but it varies among individuals. Why that is, we don't know. It may be that if you drink in moderation, you're just more, the alcohol relaxes you, you have less stress, or it's an indication of just your uh, more moderate approach to life. Or it could be something in the alcohol itself. And, and one of the chemicals that has piqued the interest of scientists is called resveratrol. And in the laboratory, this comes from red grapes and red wine. In the laboratory, it's anti-aging. It helps these little mice find their ways around their mazes. And so what the scientists have done, they've extracted the resveratrol from the alcohol and put it into a capsule. But it's not clear that that capsule form of the resveratrol gets into your brain. And they're testing it now to see how it works. But anybody taking resveratrol here in capsule, I just would suggest to be on the safe side, just wash it down with a nice Bordeaux. <laughs> so so the, other, the other point about uh, beverages, uh, coffee and tea, caffeinated beverages in moderation also are associated with a lower risk for not only Alzheimer's, but also Parkinson's disease. Now, we're trying to understand nutrition better, and we're doing studies looking at uh, supplements, uh, spices, curcumin, which is turmeric, and you get it a lot in Indian food. In India, there's a lower rate of Alzheimer's than expected, but more importantly, in the laboratory, the curcumin is not only anti-plaque, anti-amyloid, but also anti-inflammatory. And we've got a double-blind, placebo-controlled study where we're not only looking at memory tests, but we're looking at the plaque and tangle brain scan to see if it prevents the onset of Alzheimer's. Uh, we're looking at pomegranate extract and pomegranate juice. Pomegranates have that tart taste, and they're very rich in a strong antioxidant, a polyphenol. And so we've been testing that in individuals, doing functional MRI scans. Uh, I'm a bit conservative whether this stuff works or not. So we had an initial small study that was positive, but we're following up in larger studies to see if we can replicate it. Other things you can do is uh, try to protect your head. Wear a helmet if you ride a bicycle. If you smoke, try to quit. 
<laughs> stay positive. <clears throat> positive outlook is infectious and helps your brain health. And work with your doctor. If you have high blood pressure, if you have high cholesterol, take your medicine. Not only will it lower your risk for Alzheimer's, but it will extend your life expectancy. <clears throat> We've started doing studies on uh, brain trauma and this condition you might have heard of, CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. In fact, one of our collaborators, uh, they told his story in a feature film called Concussion. And uh, he was the first to identify in football players that at autopsy, those who had caught confusion, who had a mood instability, they had the tau protein that you see in Alzheimer's. It's riddled throughout the brain. And so there's been multiple autopsy studies. And what we did for the first time <clears throat> was to see if our plaque and tangle scan technology could show the pattern of this deposition in football players. So we've looked at uh, a number of retired uh, professional football players. We started looking at military personnel. And the, the results are quite interesting. Here you see examples of uh, three different scans. Uh, on the left, you see AD, or Alzheimer's disease. And the colored areas show you where there's plaque and tangle in the brain. <clears throat> and you can see it's quite spread out throughout the outer rim, the cortex of the brain. The middle image is of a control individual where there's much lower binding. And the one to the right is CTE. This is a retired player. And you can see, you see more of it, but it's a different pattern. In particular, you see there's an area, it may be hard to see it, up, up in the front underneath the temples. It's called the amygdala. In all these scans, we see the amygdala has a lot of activity. And that's interesting because that's an emotional control center of the brain. And what we find in these athletes, it's not just that they're getting confused, but they're irritable, they become suicidal, they have lots of emotional control problems. So we're continuing these studies, trying to understand this more, because we think that if we can get this technique worked out, this will be a way of identifying this kind of head trauma problem early on where we can get people into clinical trials of innovative treatments. There's no treatment right now for this kind of problem. It also will help us differentiate Alzheimer's disease from this head trauma condition of CTE so we can get the Alzheimer patients on the proper treatment. Now, my book, The Alzheimer's Prevention Program, uses that term prevention. <clears throat> and what I found out after I published it, that was a controversial term that a lot of people are saying, well, you can't prevent Alzheimer's. You know, that's impossible. We don't have the data. But I think one of the problems was that they were using the term prevention to mean cure. And I would agree with them. We have no cure. But if we think of prevention as a more modest goal of delaying the onset of symptoms, I think we're going in that direction and we're seeing some hope. So one way of looking at it is, if you do nothing, this is what happens to your brain. And at a certain point, you cross that line and you become demented. What we're trying to do is slow that down so maybe you have another year or two or more before you cross that line. And if you died of some intercurrent illness before then, in a way, you have prevented dementia. You've never experienced it in your lifetime. <laughs> you know, everybody chuckles at that. And I just, I guess I'm too much of a scientific geek to get it. But I guess maybe somebody will explain the joke to me. But uh, <laughs> so we can't, at this point, we haven't proved we could prevent Alzheimer's. It would take a, a Framingham type study, you know, a decade, millions of dollars. But frankly, I don't want to wait 10 years for somebody to tell me you should be exercising, you should be eating right, because it turns out a lot of these strategies not only <clears throat> delay the onset of Alzheimer's, but it prevents diabetes, for example, exercise and diet. And if you look at the available evidence from epidemiological studies, you can make calculations. So here's a study, physical exercise. You know, if you do it right and you do enough of it, it will give you another two years dementia-free. Eating fruits and vegetables, you know, some more help. And as we saw in the Gallup study, that you could have an additive effect. The more you do, 
the better it is for your brain. So you can take a, an example of a patient. It's pretty typical. People come into my office. They, they don't have dementia, but they're worried about their memory. <clears throat> and I'll say, well, you know, here's a guy. He's at the computer all day, watches TV, doesn't get any exercise. It's a terrible diet. And you know, I'll say, well, you got to exercise and eat right. And he'll say, well, don't you have a pill, doc? And I say, well, there's no magic pill. And finally, this guy convinced him to start exercising. So he starts walking 30 minutes every day. So with the sedentary lifestyle, this would be his trajectory for getting dementia. And if he keeps walking, he's going to gain a couple of dementia-free years, according to the epidemiological study. So now he gets excited. He's walking with a friend. He's more social. He starts changing his diet. He starts doing mental aerobics. And of course, to my chagrin, he's doing the Friday New York Times puzzle in ink. So it's something I can't do. And, and puzzle fans know that it gets harder towards the end of the week. And now if you add all that up, if you assume there's an additive effect, he's going to have four dementia-free years, which is really an impact for the individual. And scientists have looked at this in terms of the public health impact. And they calculate the number of cases of dementia in the US and worldwide. And they look at these various modifiable risk factors, like smoking, physical inactivity, diabetes, obesity. And they calculate that if you could just reduce this by 25%, uh, worldwide, you'd have 17 million fewer cases. That's huge. So how do you get people to change? Well, we're starting it here. We're educating. Because when all of us get the fact that our behavior affects our brain, we're more inclined to do something about it. We need to create programs that are fun and easy. You know, if I, I had a book, my most recent book is Two Weeks to a Younger Brain. If I called it two years to a younger brain, I don't think we'd sell anything. But the, but the idea is to get people on these programs, make it easy, and give them little assessment tools as they go along so they can see the results. It's a bit like going on a diet and getting on the scale, and you see, oh my god, I lost a, a pound. You're more motivated to continue for the long haul, because that's really what it's about, is creating a brain-healthy lifestyle for life. So what's the future? Where do we go from here? Well, we're at UCLA. We're taking these various modifiable risk factors. And in, in the United States, we have an electronic medical record. And so we're, we can go into the database of uh, half a million people, and we can find out who's in a certain age, who has a risk factor, diabetes or obesity. And then we can try to recruit them for our studies to try to see if it makes a difference. And in the short run, we're, work, we're looking at memory performance. We call this the UCLA Alzheimer's Prevention Project, which was funded not by the government, but by uh, a grateful donor. And actually, we're very grateful to, to those donors, the Collins family. And so what we're trying to do is to see a cognitive benefit after three months compared to being on the wait list. But we want to follow these people over time. We want to find that it actually saves the health system money. This is when you're going to get people's attention. We've done other studies showing there is an economic cost to progressive cognitive impairment. The costs go up dramatically. And so if we can keep people functioning better, they're more likely to take their medicines. They're more likely to go to their doctor appointment and not show up in the emergency room. And this is going to save the health system. So let's see how well all of you did. Do you remember his name? Paul Foreman. Very good. Harry. Lisa, now that's, you did very well. Every once in a while, somebody will say Mona. <laughs> and so it's not a perfect system. Once I met a guy named uh, Mr. Waldorf, and I almost called him Mr. Astoria because I saw him standing in front of the famous hotel. And then, of course, Sue Bangle. So do we have any volunteers? Who, anybody want to tell us their story with a booming voice? You want to stand up and belt out your story? Let's give her a big hand. <clears throat> uh, that was fantastic. Now, did, did you have the cigar? Did you? He had the cigar. OK. So how many of you saw the nun smoking the cigar? OK. Now, I bet you a lot of you went to Catholic school, right? How many saw the teddy bear? 
There's a few. How about the professor smoking the cigar? Okay, so we could probably break up into three groups. And uh, you like-minded individuals saw the same image. Now, this is what we find. People have a lot of fun doing these techniques. And it really does make a difference when they apply it to their everyday life. So let me just uh, draw a few conclusions. You know, I think it's an exciting time in Alzheimer's research. There's really fascinating work going on with biomarkers and, and scanning to try to detect the problem early. There are lots of interesting drug development approaches that I think will give us more medicines in the next few years. Probably not a blockbuster disease-modifying drug, but something that can be added to the current regimen that will make a difference. But while we're waiting for science to catch up, there's a lot we all can do to keep our brains healthy, to actually extend our life expectancy and improve our quality of life and hopefully delay the onset of Alzheimer's. For more information, here's a couple of my websites, longevity.ucla.edu at the university, and my book website, drgarysmall.com, drgarysmall.com. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Small. Uh, absolutely outstanding, exhilarating uh, journey that you've taken us, us on today. We're going to ask some questions now, and I've got two people with remotes. And where are we going to start? Can I put hand, Can you put hands up those that have got the microphones? So if you okay, have we've got one coming down here. I'm Sue Giddens, I'm the General Manager of the Neurological Foundation and um, we're so thrilled to have Dr Small here for the week. After this we're going to go to the Centre for Brain Research and then we're going to Christchurch and hopefully we'll have a full house there tomorrow as well. So we'll start asking some questions. Audrey, I think you've got one up here. Oh, hello, yes. Uh, for Dr Gary Small, you mentioned a uh, memory program that uh, you're running in many, many countries around the world, and I wondered if you were going to discuss with people in New Zealand about introducing that program here. I think that would be wonderful if we did that, and uh, we can have conversations. What we need to do is find a group that is interested. I, I don't know if your foundation or the Alzheimer's Association, a lot of times we license to community hospitals, to senior centers, uh, to nonprofit organizations, and I'd be happy to discuss this with uh, with the group here, anybody who's interested. I think it really helps a lot of people. And the good news is, we don't have to translate it. So, <laughs> I think for Canada, we may have to translate it. Have to put in a few. <laughs> yeah. Fabulous. Okay. Next question. We've got one down here, Audrey. Could I get you to put your hand up, please, sir? Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name's Jim Lallo. I'm a family doctor from Mount Eden, uh, but also a Canadian, so... <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there a translator in the house? <laughs> um, I've been here a number of years, so I'm all right. Uh, <laughs> I really am an honorary New Zealander. Um, I, I look after quite a few people. My, my practice is an older group, and um, we're using quite a bit of the Alzheimer medications, and of course there's always a dilemma in starting these things. They seem to sort of help people two or three units on this Alzheimer's scales and so forth. And we're left with the dilemma about stopping. I wonder if you have any insight into that. I know it's more the end stage care of Alzheimer's, and you've spent the last hour talking about prevention in the early parts of Alzheimer's, but I wonder if you have a perspective that might help us. So this is a, a big challenge. When do you stop the medicine? We have no blood test or marker to tell us when to stop. I showed you the slide that if you stop these medicines too soon, patients get worse. So we don't want that to happen. What the studies have shown is that uh, they generally benefit people at the mild, moderate, and even in some of the more severe stages, uh, they've done studies in nursing home patients where there's, there is some benefit. So I think it comes down to uh, really a discussion with the family and a judgment call when the patient, uh, the quality of life is so poor, you wonder, is this really doing that much? And I think that's, that's often a hard discussion, but it's, it's something that you have to be realistic about. Mm. Just down here, Audrey, thank you. 
Uh, Gary, you mentioned uh, uh, as far as nutrition is concerned, eating nuts. Uh, are there uh, differences between the various nuts that we can buy in the supermarket? Well, there certainly are differences uh, in the various nuts. You know, it's funny, I was trained as a psychiatrist, so when you say nuts, it means something <laughs> different to me. But, uh, so, you know, for example, if you have high blood pressure, you're probably better off consuming a nut that is unsalted because the salt will elevate your blood pressure. But, uh, you know, each of the different nuts have different levels of, say, omega-3 fats. So, for example, a very omega-3 rich nut is a walnut. So if you're concerned about that, you can, you know, a great uh, between-meal snack would be some walnuts and maybe some yogurt. Uh, so you get, you know, really a balance of uh, protein and carbohydrate. So there are, you know, there's a whole literature on these various nuts and which ones are better or worse. The other thing you got to think about uh, nuts and fats is moderation, again, because if you eat too much, you're going to gain weight. So thank you for that question. We've got one just through here in the middle. A concern about the potential relationship between those who suffer from migraines and the onset of dementia. Do you, can you comment on that, please? So to my knowledge, uh, migraine headaches are not a risk factor for dementia. So, and, and I'm not sure how carefully uh, scientists have looked at it, but it's certainly there have been so many large-scale epidemiological studies and are often looking at different illnesses. They have found that untreated depression increases the risk for dementia, but not migraines, to my mind. There's somebody right in front there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gary. Uh, brain injury. Um, a lot of sports people have brain injury, and a lot of other people have brain injury. Uh, are you doing research with people who've had brain injury um, at various stages of their life, and um, the fitness factor when they have that, um, and the uh, people who recover from brain injury, but their potential for dementia? So there, you know, we are studying brain injury uh, and with a focus on this condition of suspected chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So at this stage, we're looking at different sports people. We're actually in a fundraising stage trying to find the funds. We've written a number of grants and hopefully we'll be successful this year in moving these studies forward. So we don't have a program that is looking at all, brain injury is a huge area. So many people are affected and at risk. Uh, we're not doing that, but it's a more targeted approach. But uh, people who have studied this, they found, for example, if you bump your head and you have a concussion and it leads to an hour or more of unconsciousness, that doubles your risk for Alzheimer's. Uh, and in terms of how to treat the brain injury, there's a lot that's, that is unknown. How long do you have people rest? When do they get back to other activities? And we have some collaborators who are working on this in detail. We'll go up to you, Pip. There you've got a couple of people who've got questions, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gary, for your um, informative talk. Excuse me if I'm asking a question that you've already talked about because I walked in a bit late. But recently I heard um, Professor David Smith from Oxford University talking. Um, my name is Mary and I'm a chiropractor. So I'm interested in neurological function as well. Uh, his take on Alzheimer's was that uh, it is not, um, and it's not an inevitable part of aging, but it's mainly a genetic disease, number one. And number two, the importance of vitamin B, in particular vitamin B12 and B6. Uh, he was actually saying that his take was that this was the only proven uh, tablet that you could take, the vitamin B, that could actually really help people in so, um, the stopping of dementia. So let me say, you know, I should have interrupted you because you asked me a two-part question, so you're testing my short-term memory. That's Sorry. not fair. <laughs> so I think the first part, he said that it's genetics. Well, I, I describe genetics as, as a component. Genetics are important for a minority of people. It causes the disease. For the rest of us, it can increase our risk. But there's a lot of studies showing that there's more than just genetics and also more than just vitamin B6 and vitamin B12 
which are important if you have a deficiency in those vitamins that can affect your memory and you should be treated with it. So I respectfully disagree. But um, so you're a chiropractor. Can you meet me afterwards? I've got a little. Sure. <laughs> um, and interestingly, I um, cytokines, you know, inflammatory markers running around in the blood. I had a gastroenterologist who was talking to me about the relationship between, you know, the, obviously the gut brain axis. And personally, myself, I was a migraine sufferer and I had a big section of my bowel taken out and I no longer suffer from migraines. So there's an interesting correlation between, I think, inflammation in the body and the, the cytokines and all the other inflammatory markers that are running around. And so perhaps gut health is again a key factor. Well, thank, thank you, you for you sharing very much. I'm glad you're feeling better. Thank you, Sue. We're coming up to you. Uh, Dr. David Perlmutter, who's a neurologist, you probably have heard of him. Um, he talks about coconut oil being a primer for production of BDNF in the brain. Do you have any comment to make about that? So coconut oil has gotten a lot of attention. A woman, I think, published a book about how her spouse took coconut oil and it really helped with the symptoms. And there's actually now more systematic studies looking at that. Um, in anticipation of this question, I kind of checked online and there was a small study it showed some possible benefits, but it was really hard. It was translated from another language. It was hard to really make much out of it. Now, coconut oil, it actually leads to uh, an alternative source of food for the brain. Our brains uh, need glucose or sugar. That's the main food source for the, the brain. But with coconut oil, uh, the fats in it lead to ketones being produced and feeding the brain. That's the theory behind uh, this kind of fat, fatty acid. Uh, I, I'm an, a skeptic or an agnostic when it comes to these kinds of things. I think it's, it's important to follow them up. Right now there are clinical trials showing whether it works or doesn't. One of the concerns about coconut oil has the kinds of fats that might not be good for heart health. So until we have more information, I'm a little conservative about it. Thank you. Okay, we'll go two more questions. Pip, we'll do one on your side, please. Have we got any just over here? Oh, upstairs. Oh my God, I'm so sorry I didn't look at you during the talk. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll send a mic upstairs. So there's someone with an outside voice upstairs who has a question? I can, I can project Fantastic. Yeah, could we you kind of keep it down a little bit? It's kind of <laughs> too much. There you go, thank you. who might or might have not have been smoking a cigar, a cigar. I'm aware of the fact that there's a wonderful longitudinal study um, involving nuns, and I was wondering if there's anything in that study that is currently informing the way you approach um, your research about um, dementia. So, that, so thank you for sharing that information with us. The, the famous nun study uh, from I believe it was in Kentucky. Actually, I, I believe I'm going to be visiting their center uh, later this year. They uh, looked at nuns and followed them over their lifetime. And so they, these nuns entered their convents, and in their 20s, they wrote diaries, and then they followed their mental ability up, up into their 70s. And one of the most interesting things they found was how the nuns wrote in their 20s predicted whether they get Alzheimer's or not. And those that had more complex language, uh, had an, a greater vocabulary, those are the ones whose brain was preserved. Now, what does that mean? It could be that they had good brain genes that gave them those better uh, 
mental abilities. It could be that they had more education. So it, it doesn't prove the nature-nurture issue, but it does give us some interesting information. So, you know, until we find out more, I would not recommend starting to write run-on sentences to protect your brain. <laughs> it's probably just a marker of something going on early on. Do you have one more question? One more question upstairs. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, just down here. So I'll repeat the question because not everybody heard it. What, has there been anything done on the effect of marijuana smoking on Alzheimer's? And I believe in, in the book Alzheimer's Prevention Program, we do cite some of that research. And there have been some studies, uh, actually in our group and some other groups, uh, they've found that in young people who use marijuana extensively, that hippocampus and medial temporal lobe is actually smaller. So that's a concern at a certain age that it may have a detrimental effect. At the other end of the spectrum, you know, we know, in, I don't, is marijuana legal here in New Zealand? No. <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> There's another, I don't know what the joke, you have to explain the jokes to me, Sue, later. I don't know what I'm, I'm that's right. <laughs> I need to understand. They're waiting for the punchline, right? So now I've lost track. So, so at the other end, there are actually geriatric psychiatrists who have used marijuana as a, a, a treatment to try to calm down patients who have dementia and are agitated. The results are not quite conclusive yet. But the other thing interesting about marijuana, there, you know, there's marijuana and marijuana. There are different com components or cannabinols and other chemicals. Some of the chemicals have more of that hallucinogenic effect. Others have more of a sedating effect. So I think it's, it's an interesting um, uh, drug that uh, is now used actually in, in California. We have medical marijuana in Colorado. It's completely legal. So people are using this more. And I think it would be great to try to understand where there could be a place uh, to help the brain and where it might be harmful, such as in those adolescents. Mm, thank you. Um, thank you uh, to all those uh, question askers. They were very good questions. And we found over the last few years that um, because people are reading up so much on uh, brain health and brain research, they're a lot more aware and ask, are asking a, um, a lot more complex questions. So it's, it's fantastic to hear. Now, I've got some plugs as well today. Uh, the first is, uh, obviously, Dr. Small is here, um, and he's going to be... Uh, presenting public lectures and meeting with some of New Zealand's uh, world-class brain researchers while he is here. Um, I first discovered Dr. Small when uh, I downloaded some of his podcasts from iTunes U. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has uses the Apple app called iTunes U. It's a university that iTunes has. And uh, so that, that is how Dr. Small uh, came to be standing here today. So I was um, listening to his podcast while I was out walking, funnily enough, um, which was good. So little did I know how, how much good I was doing for myself. Then I discovered this book. Um, and I, I really urge everyone to try and get a hold of a copy. Uh, I know your local libraries will stock them, but if you want to purchase them, the Women's Bookshop in Ponsonby Road has actually bought up all of the stock in New Zealand. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> as a response to uh, the many calls that we've had at the Foundation offices over the last few weeks, where can I get hold of that book? And I think the one that's um, been published since then, Two Weeks to a Younger Brain, is probably going to be a bestseller in New Zealand as well. Two weeks does sound much better than two years. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Thank you. Thank you to all the scientists, the researchers and, and clinicians that have taken time out of their very, very busy lives and uh, have um, come today. And I hope many of you can meet Dr. Small this afternoon. Our Executive Director, Max Ritchie, who uh, introduced today, is flying out to Wellington this afternoon for another event down there. Thank you, Max. Our Chairman, uh, the Chairman of our National Council, Mr Ian Robertson and his wife drove from Hamilton very, very early this morning, as did many uh, of the people in the audience today, so thank you so much. The first two people to arrive here about 8 o'clock this morning uh, had come from Hamilton, and they missed all that horrible traffic that everyone else got stuck in. Um, 
Whangarei, I believe, and Kaitaia, some people from up there as well. So we're talking a three hour drive this morning to, to come down and see you. The people that support the foundation help to make Rome research happen in this country. And if you are not a member of the foundation, the headlines that hopefully you've all picked up from out the front uh, have a, a membership form in there and we would love you to join us. You can join um, by filling the slip out inside and then we will send you lots of lovely newsletters and, uh, and you can make donations to help us along the way. Thank you to all the volunteers who have helped today and thank you to all of you for attending. Uh, I know that this has been a big event that everyone's been looking forward to and um, we would very much like to bring Dr Small back in the future. We think we might aim for 5,000 next time. So uh, on behalf of the entire audience, all of the researchers uh, in New Zealand, I'd like thank to say you. thank you, Dr Gary Small. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So don't forget to pick up your headlines and there's a, um, still quite a few brochures left out there as well. So please do help yourself and uh, thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>